the principles of anti epileptic therapy yeah my email is cklpm at gmail.com yeah Yeah, as sir has already said, uh, I have my own YouTube channel, Dr. Srinivas Medical Concepts, with nearly 15,500 subscribers and about uh, 300 plus neurology videos. So here I'll be giving just an overview of anti-epileptic therapy. But if you want a detailed knowledge about individual anti-epileptic drugs or a particular subtopic, you can come back to my YouTube channel, Dr. Srinivas Medical Concepts wherein I dealt in length of all individual anti-epileptic drugs also. So yeah, please uh, visit my channel, Dr. Srinivas Medical Concepts. And if you like it, you can subscribe and share the link also. Principles of anti-epileptic therapy. But first we need to know a few definitions. What is a seizure? What is an epilepsy? A seizure is a transient occurrence of signs or symptoms due to abnormal, excessive, or synchronous neuronal activity in the brain. So seizure is a transient occurrence of signs or symptoms due to abnormal, excessive, or synchronous neuronal activity in the brain. Whereas epilepsy describes a condition in which a person has a risk of recurrent seizures due to a chronic underlying process. So how do we classify seizures? A fundamental principle is that seizures may be either focal or generalized. Focal seizures originate within networks limited to one brain region. Whereas generalized seizures arise within and rapidly engaged networks distributed across both the cerebral hemispheres. So this is a fundamental principle when we approach a person having seizures. Focal seizures are often associated with structural abnormalities of the brain. Like it could be a gliosis, it could be hematoma, it could be tumor. It's a focal. So focal seizures are often associated with structural abnormalities of the brain. So And therefore, when a person has got focal seizure, we need to take MRI and pick up any structural lesion. In contrast, generalized seizures may result from cellular biochemical example hypoglycemia or structural abnormalities that have a more widespread distribution. So focal seizures are often associated with structural abnormalities of the brain. In contrast, generalized seizures may result from cellular biochemical or structural abnormalities that have a more widespread distribution. So coming to the actual topic, the principles of anti-epileptic therapy. Therapy for a patient with a seizure disorder is almost always multimodal and includes treatment of underlying conditions that cause or contribute to the seizures, avoidance of precipitating factors, suppression of recurrent seizures by prophylactic therapy with anti-seizure medications or surgery, and addressing a wide variety of psychological and social issues. The treatment of underlying conditions. If the sole cause of a seizure is a metabolic disturbance, such as an abnormality of the serum electrolytes, sodium, example, hyponatremia also can cause seizures, or glucose, example, hypoglycemia also can cause seizures, then treatment is aimed at reversing the metabolic problem and preventing its recurrence. Therapy with anti-seizure drugs is usually unnecessary unless the metabolic disorder cannot be corrected promptly and the patient is at risk of having further seizures. Avoidance of precipitating factors. The two most important precipitating factors are one, sleep deprivation. Second is the stress. An almost universal precipitating factor for seizures is sleep deprivation. So patients should be should do everything possible to optimize their sleep quality. Second, because there's an often an association between stress and seizures, stress reduction techniques such as physical exercise, meditation, or counseling may be helpful. Anti-seizure drug therapy. 
anti seizure drug therapy is the mainstay of treatment for most patients with epilepsy the overall goal is to completely prevent seizures without causing any untoward side effects preferably with a single medication and a dosing schedule that is easy for the patient to follow seizure classification is an important element in designing the treatment plan because some anti seizure drugs have different activities against various seizure types so the selection of anti epileptic drugs for generalized onset tonic clonic seizures we choose lamotrigine valproic acid levetiracetam for focal seizures it is carbamazepine levetiracetam and valproic acid for typical absence it is ethosuximide valproic acid clonazepam and levetiracetam for atypical absence myoclonic and atonic it is valproic acid and clonazepam note that valproic acid can be used for almost all types of seizures generalized tonic clonic seizures focal seizures typical absence and atypical absence myoclonic atonic so valproic acid is a broad spectrum anti epileptic drug which can be used for almost any type of seizures the only disadvantage with valproic acid is a pregnant lady having seizures because valproic acid is a teratogenic drug if that condition is excluded that is epilepsy in pregnancy valproic acid is a wonderful broad spectrum anti epileptic drug the next drug which comes close to valproic acid which can also be given for all types of seizures except atypical absence myoclonic and atonic is levetiracetam so levetiracetam also can be used for generalized tonic tonic seizures focal seizures typical absence but it cannot be that useful for atypical absence myoclonic or atonic so the broad spectrum anti epileptic drugs are one valproic acid closely followed by levetiracetam so very very important because now people have started using levetiracetam for almost all kinds of seizures but a very good broad spectrum anti epileptic drug still remains to be valproic acid so pharmacology of anti epileptic drugs anti epileptic drugs are the cornerstone of epilepsy therapy anti seizure drug therapy should be started in any patient with recurrent seizures of unknown etiology or a known cause that cannot be reversed so anti seizure drug therapy should be started in any patient with a recurrent seizures of unknown etiology or a known cause that cannot be reversed for example hypoglycemia is a known cause that can be reversed so we need not give anti epileptic drugs for hypoglycemia anti seizure drugs we give only for a known cause that cannot be reversed so very very important point anti seizure drug therapy should be started in any patient with recurrent seizures of unknown etiology or a known cause that cannot be reversed so classification of anti epileptic drugs according to their mechanism of action very important we need to know how these anti epileptic drugs act so classification of anti epileptic drugs according to their mechanism of action first we have the sodium channel blockers they are phenytoin carbamazepine oxcarbamazepine and lacosamide we have calcium channel blockers ethosuximide and sodium valproate we have gaba agonists benzodiazepines phenobarbital gabapentin we have glutamate antagonist parampenal felbamate lamotrigine and recently introduced a new class of drugs is synaptic vesicle protein binding that is a levetiracetam and brevaricetam and then we have potassium channel opener ritigabin so we should we need to know this broad classification of drugs based on the mechanism of action so we have sodium channel blockers calcium channel blockers gaba agonists epilepsy will result when there is an imbalance between gabanergic and glutamate gabanergic drugs or gaba inhibits the seizure formation or propagation whereas glutamate excites it 
So we have to give anti-glutamate drugs or GABAergic drugs so as to control seizures. So the, the anti-epileptic drugs according to the mechanism of action are sodium channel blockers, calcium channel blockers, GABA agonists, glutamate antagonists, synaptic vesicle protein binding drugs, and potassium channel opener. Now let's see the mechanism of anti-epileptic drugs. See, here in this chart, you can see that we have sodium channel blockers. How do these sodium channel blockers act in epilepsy and even for that matter for pain relief? We give phenytoin, we give carbamazepine for persons having uh, trigeminal neuralgia, post-herpetic neuralgia. We always wonder how anti-epileptic drugs act in painful conditions. The mechanism is, is simple. They are sodium channel blockers. We have the nerve, we have nodes of Ranvier. At the internode, we have sodium channels. When there's a good number of sodium channels, an impulse generated will jump from one node of Ranvier to the other of other node of Ranvier like this, jumping from one node of Ranvier to the other node of Ranvier. We call this a saltatory conduction. So as long as the nerve is well myelinated, the sodium channels are in sufficient number, the impulse transmission is fast, rapid, and effective. But once we give sodium channel blockers like carbamazepine or phenytoin, they block the sodium channels at the internode, and therefore the impulse cannot be spread from one node of Ranier to the other node of Ranier, resulting in decreased transmission. It could be seizure or it could be a pain impulse. Whatever may be, when the sodium channels are blocked, the impulse cannot be transmitted. It could be a seizure impulse or it could be a painful impulse. And therefore, sodium channel blockers are not only useful for epilepsy, they are useful for painful conditions like post-herpetic neuralgia. In fact, for trigeminal neuralgia, carbamazepine and oxcarbamazepine is the drug of choice because they are sodium channel blockers. They inhibit the pain transmission from one node of failure to the other node of failure. Then we have the calcium channel blockers. You can see in the diagram, uh, calcium channel blockers are very effective for absence seizures. In fact, ethosuximide is the drug, but unfortunately the drug is not available in India. So we give sodium valproate. Then we have drugs which antagonize glutamate, drugs which enhance GABA. Then we have drugs acting on the synaptic vesicle 2A inhibitors. Uh, that is a levitaristam. So these are all the various drugs acting on the neuron at various sites and uh, controlling the seizures. So this is a diagram depicting the various classes of drugs based on the mechanism of action. So the point I would like to convey is that sodium channel blockers are useful for even pain control. Example, example trigeminal neuralgia, the drug being oxcarbamazepine, a sodium channel blocker. Yeah, now we'll talk about the individual anti-epileptic drugs, phenobarbital. Phenobarbital is the oldest anti-epileptic drug. It exerts its anti-epileptic action by binding to GABA-A receptor and prolongs the opening of associated chloride channel, resulting in increased chloride influx. The increase in intracellular chloride results in hyperpolarization of the postsynaptic neuronal membrane, which helps in interrupting the spread of epileptic activity. It is a strong inducer of hepatic P450 enzyme system and thus accelerates the metabolism of drugs metabolized by the liver, such as oral anticoagulants. Here I want to introduce a concept, a new concept regarding anti-epileptic drugs, especially in terms of drug-drug interactions. We have hepatic enzyme inducing drugs. We have hepatic enzyme inhibiting drugs. Hepatic enzyme inducing anti-epileptic drugs are phenobarbital, phenytoin, and carbamazepine. So when they induce hepatic enzymes, the drugs which use this hepatic enzyme pathway get metabolized fast and their action is of short duration. And therefore, when we drugs, when we give drugs along with phenytoin, carbamazepine, or phenobarbital, drugs such as oral anticoagulants, they get metabolized fast and their action becomes short, resulting in contraception failure. 
is a very important concepts we need to know when we are giving hepatic enzyme inducing drugs like phenobarbital, phenytoin and carbamazepine. At the other end of the spectrum, we have hepatic enzyme inhibiting anti-epileptic drug. The classic example is sodium valproate. Sodium valproate inhibits hepatic enzyme and therefore drugs using this pathway they get metabolized very slowly and their action gets prolonged. And therefore, we have to give a smaller dose of that particular drug when we combine with sodium valproate. The classic exam is lamotrigine. When we give sodium valproate, it inhibits hepatic enzymes and therefore, it prolongs the action of lamotrigine. And therefore, when we want to give lamotrigine along with sodium valproate, we have to give a very small dose of lamotrigine because its action gets prolonged due to the inhibition of the hepatic enzymes done by sodium valproate. Why I'm insisting this point is that sodium valproate and lamotrigine are the best synergistic anti-epileptic drug combination known so far. Sodium valproate and lamotrigine are the best synergistic anti-epileptic drug combination known so far. But an important concept is that when we give lamotrigine along with sodium valproate, we should not go ahead with the usual dose of lamotrigine. We have to give a smaller dose of lamotrigine because sodium valproate is a hepatic enzyme inhibiting drug. So very important concept, hepatic enzyme inducing drugs, hepatic enzyme inhibiting drugs. So phenobarbital, phenytoin and carbamazepine are hepatic enzyme inducing anti-epileptic drugs whereas sodium valproate is hepatic enzyme inhibiting anti-epileptic drug. So phenobarbital is a strong inducer of hepatic P450 enzyme system and thus accelerates the metabolism of drugs metabolized by liver such as oral anticoagulants. It has a half life of 70 to 110 hours, which is the longest of all anti-epileptic drugs and can be given once a day. It is a broad spectrum anti-epileptic drug and can be used in status epilepticus. Yeah, phenytoin. Phenytoin was a wonder anti-epileptic drug. It still continues to be wonder anti-epileptic drug, especially people below the poverty line. Because now many neurologists have started using levetiristam and brevaricetam, but still a drug which is of a low economical, uh, which is of a low price and can be given for people with the, anti-epileptic people of uh, people belong to lower socioeconomic status is still phenytoin. Phenytoin is a sodium channel blocker again. It blocks voltage gated sodium channels by stabilizing its inactive site, inactive state. It produces a, a voltage and frequency dependent block in channels conductance thus preventing high frequency repetitive firing which occurs during seizures. Due to its frequency dependent blockade, it does not block normal action potentials and hence does not have generalized depressing effects on the central nervous system. Again, as I said earlier, phenobarbiton, phenytoin and carbamazepine are a strong en hepatic enzyme inducing anti-epileptic drugs. So phenytoin is a strong enzyme inducer and has drug interactions with multiple drugs. Another important point regarding phenytoin is that it follows non-linear kinetics. What is linear kinetics and non-linear kinetics? Most of the drugs follow linear kinetics. That is, as you increase the dose of the drug, its action, its effectiveness also starts increasing and the actions are better seen. So as the dose of the drug is increased, the effectiveness of the drug also starts increasing. This is known as linear kinetics. It goes in a linear way. But phenytoin follows a non-linear kinetics. As you start increasing the dose of the drug, its, its action becomes disproportionately increased. It goes like this and goes disproportionately high. So if you increase, say, 200 to 300 milligrams, the actions are, are slightly better. 400 to 500, slightly better. When you go from but 500 to 600, its action is disproportionately increased. And from 600 to 700, still disproportionately increased, resulting not only uh, good actions, but also a lot of unwanted side effects. So we need to be careful when we give phenytoin and know about this concept, the non-linear kinetics. Due to its saturable metabolism, 
phenytoin follows non linear kinetics beyond a certain dose there is a disproportionate increase in serum levels with incremental doses hence a small increase in dose also can produce toxicity so phenytoin an important concept we need to remember is that it follows non linear kinetics phenytoin is effective against all types of partial and secondary generalized seizures and status epilepticus it is not effective against myoclonic and axon seizures and may even aggravate these seizure types for parenteral use phosphenetone is a better choice as it does not cause local reactions less incidence of hypotension and can be infused more rapidly so for status epilepticus we prefer phosphenetone or phenetone because it does not cause local reactions less incidence of hypotension and can be infused more rapidly yeah so far we have finished phenobarbital phenytoin now we shall look into the carbamazepine carbamazepine it acts by frequency dependent blockade of the voltage gated sodium channels again it is an inducer of the cytochrome p450 system resulting in significant drug interactions so phenytoin phenobarbital carbamazepine are strong hepatic enzyme inducing anti epileptic drugs sodium valproate is a hepatic enzyme inhibiting anti epileptic drug like non linear kinetics is an important concept for phenytoin there is an important concept in carbamazepine that is auto induction an important concept we need to know about carbamazepine is auto induction carbamazepine induces its own metabolism known as auto induction which results in shorter half life and lower drug levels over 2 to 4 weeks it takes about 4 weeks to reach steady state levels so carbamazepine induces its own auto its own metabolism very interesting carbamazepine induces its own metabolism known as auto induction which results in shorter half life and lower drug levels over 2 to 4 weeks it takes about 4 weeks to reach steady state levels the most important active metabolite of carbamazepine is carbamazepine 10 11 epoxide which is responsible for the many of its side effects but unlike carbamazepine oxcarbamazepine does not produce epoxide metabolites which is responsible for the side effects of carbamazepine therefore lot of neurologists and lot of physicians have started using oxcarbamazepine instead of carbamazepine usual starting dose of carbamazepine is 200 mg at night which can be increased by 200 mg every week to a maintenance dose of 800 mg per day in two divided doses why i am stressing this starting dose is that always in epilepsy the dictum is that start low go slow start low go slow that means we have to start with the smallest possible effective dose dose and slowly start increasing otherwise it will produce lot of side effects so again i am emphasizing for anti epileptic drugs the dictum is start low start a low dose goes to slowly start increasing and the second dictum for anti epileptic therapy is that monotherapy for tuberculosis we give polytherapy so as to prevent drug resistance but for epilepsy as far as possible monotherapy is dictum we start only with one anti epileptic drug only if it is not controlled we go for two or more drugs but most of the time with a single anti epileptic drug seizures get controlled so carbamazepine is the best option for initial monotherapy for focal epilepsy so for focal epilepsy the drug of choice is still carbamazepine so it is the best option for initial monotherapy for focal epilepsy valproate the next important drug is sodium valproate as i said valproate is a broad spectrum anti epileptic drug you name any type of seizure it is effective be it generalized tonic clonic seizures be it a focal seizure absence seizures atypical absence myoclonic atonic seizure any type of seizure sodium valproate is active and therefore it is a broad spectrum anti epileptic drug but for one small disadvantage of val valproate that is in pregnant ladies with epilepsy we avoid sodium valproate because sodium valproate is a highly teratogenic anti epileptic drug 
causing neural tube defects. But for this disadvantage, valproate is a wonderful anti-epileptic drug. In fact, it's a broad spectrum anti-epileptic drug, which can be used against any type of seizure disorder. It has multiple actions and also has an inhibitory effect on T-type calcium currents, which is useful in absence epilepsy. It is effective against all seizure types, including myoclonic seizures. As I said earlier, where I, I kept on repeating, here also, sodium valproate, unlike other anti-epileptic drugs like phenytoin, and phenobarbitone, carbamazepine, is a potent enzyme inhibitor and results in increased concentration of other drugs such as lamotrigine. And valproate has the highest potential of teratogenicity among all anti-epileptic drugs and can produce major congenital malformations such as neural tube defects, cardiac malformations, and cleft palate. What are these neural tube defects? As the brain and spinal cord are getting formed, we have a neural tube. Around 25, 26 days of, of the pregnancy, we have a nice neural tube being formed. We have an anterior pore, we have a posterior pore. The anterior pore should close and the posterior pore should close. Around 25 plus, plus or minus two days. If the anterior pore does not close, the brain contents will come out of the opening, evaginates, resulting in anencephaly. The skull is not found, but the brain comes out. If the posterior pore does not close, the spinal cord comes out, resulting in spina bifida. So these are known as the neural tube defects. So neural tube defect, neural tube should close, the anterior pore should close, and the posterior pore should close around 26 days. If the anterior pore does not close, the brain content, the cranial part comes out of the anterior pore, resulting in brain coming out known as anencephaly. The brain evaginates. If the posterior pore does not close, the spinal cord comes out. It is known as spina bifida. And therefore, these are the neural tube defects associated with valproate. And uh, these neural tube defects the closure of the anterior pore and posterior pore, as I said, is seen around 26 days. So most of the time, the pregnant women, the women are not even aware that they are having a baby and that they are having neural tube defects because menstrual cycle is 28 days plus. So even before they get, they realize that they have missed the next menstrual period, they would have been pregnant and the fetus might have had neural tube defects if the person is on sodium valproate. So very important point, when a person is on valproate, please consider stopping valproate if the woman is likely to get pregnant or is planning pregnancy. Because if she continues to take drug even before she realizes that she is pregnant by missing out the period, she's already had neural tube defects because they form around 26 days. And even before she misses out the next period, she would have already been pregnant and would have had neural tube defects. So very important point, sodium valproate, Though a wonder drug, though a broad spectrum anti-epileptic is highly teratogenic, causes neural tube defects. And at least to some extent, we try to prevent it by giving folic acid. So neural tube defects, cardiac malformations, and cleft palate. The usual starting dose in adults is 200 milligrams per day, which can be increased by 200 milligrams every seven days to a maintenance dose of 1000 milligrams in two divided doses. Intravenous valproate is also being increasingly used as second line therapy in status epilepticus. So where sodium valproate also can be used as an IV preparation in status epilepticus. Levitirizam. This drug has become immensely popular in the recent few days. It binds to the synaptic vesicle protein SV2A and modulates synaptic transmission through alteration of vesicle fusion. SV2A is important for bioavailability of calcium dependent neurotransmitter vesicles. This lack of SV2A causes a decrease in action potential dependent neurotransmission. Why this levitrism has become so popular, immensely popular among clinicians and neurologists is that it has practically no drug interactions. I repeat, levitrism practically has got no drug interaction. Why levitrism does not have drug interactions? It is neither metabolized by the cytochrome system 
nor it induces hepatic enzymes, nor it inhibits hepatic enzymes, and thus has no drug interactions. I told in the beginning of my lecture that phenytoin, phenobarbitone, carbamazepine are hepatic enzyme inducing drugs, and therefore they metabolize other drugs acting through this pathway faster, whereas sodium valproate is a hepatic enzyme inhibited drug, and therefore it prolongs the action of other drugs using this pathway, whereas levetiracetam neither induces hepatic enzymes, nor inhibits hepatic enzymes, nor gets metabolized by the liver and therefore there are practically no drug interactions so especially in elderly people who have a lot of comorbidities people are giving levetiracetam because since there are no drug drug intra interactions epilepsy in elderly this is the drug of choice pregnancy and epilepsy again levetiracetam is a drug of choice it has practically no teratogenic potential so though valproate is a broad spectrum anti-epileptic drug, it has got a disadvantage in pregnancy because it is a teratogenic drug. Levitism is almost as effective as sodium valproate in terms of its action as a broad spectrum anti-epileptic drug. And on top of it, it has got an advantage that it is a safe drug in pregnancy, no teratogenic potential. And the best part is that there are no drug-drug interactions. So levitism is becoming immensely popular. It is one of the least teratogenic potential, it has got one of the least teratogenic potential among all anti-epileptic drugs. So levitiristam and oxcarbamazepine and lamotrigine are wonderful anti-epileptic drugs in pregnancy with epilepsy. So levitiristam has got one of the least teratogenic potential among all AEDs. The usual starting dose is 200 milligrams once or twice daily, which can be increased by 200 milligrams every week to a dose of 1,500 to 3,000 milligrams per day in two divided doses. Due to its ease of use, lack of any drug interactions, minimal teratogenic potential, and lack of major side effects, it is fast becoming as the initial therapy of choice for all types of seizures. So as I've been mentioning, as I've been emphasizing, Levitistem is becoming the initial therapy of choice for all types of seizures. Benzodiazepines. They act on GABA-A receptor, increasing the frequency of GABA-A mediated chloride channel openings. Midazolam, lorazepam and diazepam are used only in the acute management of seizures and status epilepticus due to the rapid development of tolerance because they are 1,4 benzodiazepines. Because they are 1,4 benzodiazepines, midazolam, lorazepam, and diazepam are used only in the management of acute seizures and status epilepticus. They cannot be used on a long-term basis. Whereas clobazam, which is a 1,5 benzodiazepine, and clonazepam, they are used in the long treatment of epilepsy. So very important point. Midazolam, lorazepam, diazepam are used only for acute management of seizures whereas clobazam and clonazepam can be used for chronic seizures and long-term treatment of epilepsy. Another important concept for clobazam is that it can be used as an intermittent therapy. Intermittent therapy. Generally, when we start treating patients with epilepsy with anti-epileptic drugs, they are used for at least two to five years. But there are certain situations where you need not give over a period of two to five years continuously. There are some seizures which occurs in episodes. For example, catamenial epilepsy, epilepsy occurring in women only during menstruation, or hot water epilepsy, seizures occurring in children only, sorry, the febrile seizures, seizures occurring in children only when they have high fever, or hot water epilepsy. Some people develop seizures when they have hot water. So there are certain seizure types which occur only when there are some precipitating factors. So for those kind of seizures, there's no point and it's a waste of effort to continue giving long-term anti-epileptic drugs because they have a lot of side effects. So in such situations where you need intermittent therapy, only when you anticipate seizures, only during that particular part of seizures, that particular period of seizures, we have a wonderful drug, clobazam. Clobazam is a wonderful drug which can be useful for, as an, which can be useful for intermittent therapy. For example, women, who's going to throw seizures during her menstruation, just give clobazam during those few days. If a person, a child is, is having high fever and is, is likely to develop 
February seizures, just give clobazam during that period. And then once the fever subsets, you can stop it, like with hot water epilepsy. So clobazam is a wonderful drug, which can be given as an intermittent therapy, unlike other anti-epileptic drugs, which we give on a on a day-to-day -day basis continuously for a period of two to five years. So another important concept of clobazam is that it can be given as an intermittent therapy. Clonazepam is especially useful for myoclonic seizures and can be used as an adjunctive treatment in juvenile myoclonic epilepsy. Juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, as the name suggests, it occurs in adults. They have myoclonus, especially in the morning. So the classic history, what they get is that when they get up in the morning and they take, when they are able to take coffee, they are not able to take coffee because of myoclonus. The coffee spills over. If that is the kind of history you are getting, it is most likely a juvenile myoclonic epilepsy. It's not a dangerous condition, it's a benign condition, but the treatment is usually lifetime. As I said, clobazam can be given as intermittent therapy. Clobazam can be used for intermittent prophylaxis of febrile seizures, catamenial epilepsy, or hot water epilepsy. So this clobazam, this drug clobazam is a wonderful drug when it comes to treat seizures which are of intermittent nature. Lorazepam is the drug of choice as the first line anti-epileptic for status epilepticus due to its rapid and sustained anti-epileptic action. Intranasal midazolam is very effective for pre-hospital treatment of status epilepticus and can be used as a rescue medicine in patients with seizure clustering. Suppose person is throwing seizures and is still not yet reached hospital. So for pre-hospital treatment, intranasal midazolam is a wonderful drug because IV lorazepam or any other drug, it can cause respiratory embarrassment and it is better to be given in a hospital setting. But for pre-hospital seizures, if a seizure has to be controlled, a good drug is an intranasal midazolam. Vigabactin. The most important and serious side effect is progressive and irreversible constriction of visual fields, which can occur in approximately one third of the patients. Its main use remains in the initial treatment of infantile spasms, especially in cases with tuberous sclerosis, where it can produce a remission in 50 to 70 percent of patients. So Vigabat is a wonderful drug for the person suffering from infantile spasms due to tuberous sclerosis, but its main drawback and side effect is the visual field defects. Yeah, so far we started, we discussed about the anti-epileptic drugs. Now, having started anti-epileptic drugs, when can we discontinue the anti-epileptic drugs? Discontinuation of anti-epileptic drugs. It seems reasonable to attempt withdrawal of therapy after two years who meets the following criteria. So it seems reasonable to attempt withdrawal of therapy after two years who meet the following criteria. One, the complete medical control of seizures for one to five years. Single seizure type with generalized seizures having a better prognosis than focal seizures. Normal neurological examination, including intelligence, no family history of epilepsy and normal EEG. So it seems reasonable to attend withdrawal of therapy after two years who meets the following criteria. Surgical therapy of refractory epilepsy. The combination of valproate with lamotrigin is excellent option in resistant cases of all types of epilepsy. As I said earlier, this is the best synergistic anti-epileptic drug combination, sodium valproate and lamotrigin. So even if the seizures are not responding, it is always better to try to use this combination and try to control the resistant seizures. Only if it is not getting controlled, we go for surgical therapy if there is a possibility. So the combination of valproate with lamotrigin is an excellent combination in resistant cases of all types of epilepsies. Approximately 20 to 30% of patients with epilepsy continue to have seizures despite efforts to find an effective combination of anti-seizure drugs. For some patients with focal epilepsy, example, mesial temporal sclerosis, surgery can be extremely effective in substantially reducing seizure frequency and even providing complete seizure control. Status epilepticus. Status epilepticus refers to continuous seizures 
or repetitive discrete seizures with impaired consciousness in the interictal period. So status epilepticus refers to continuous seizures or repetitive seizures with impaired consciousness in the interictal period. Status epilepticus occurs when mechanisms that normally abort seizures fail, either because of excessive excitation due to glutamate or ineffective inhibition because of the GABA. Another important point of status epilepticus is that why do we give lorazepam only in the initial phase of status epilepticus? Why we don't give lorazepam in the later phase of status epilepticus? Why do we give drugs like ketamine in the later phase of status epilepticus? To understand this, we need to understand an important concept. The early part of the status epilepticus is because of the decreased levels of GABA. The early part of status epilepticus is due to decreased levels of GABA, gamma aminobutyric acid. And therefore, we give drugs which enhance GABA levels like lorazepam. But during the later phase of the status epilepticus, the seizures is because of the excessive glutamate activity. The later part of status epilepticus is due to excessive glutamate activity. And therefore, we give drugs which antagonize glutamate. NMDA glutamate antagonist like ketamine, very important point. And therefore, lorazepam is not effective in the later part of status epilepticus. It is only effective in the initial or the early phase of the status epilepticus. So with the increasing duration of status epilepticus, there is a mechanistic shift from GABA-A receptor-mediated inhibition to NMDA receptor-mediated excitation. So initially, we give GABAergic drugs at a later part of status, we give glutamate antagonistic drugs like ketamine. Very important point. So this is the way we treat status epilepticus. We usually give IV benzodiazepine like lorazepam is the drug of choice. Impending an early status epilepticus from 5 to 30 minutes. After that, we give IV anti-seizure drugs like phenytoin 220 mg per kg body weight or phosphenetan or levetiristam. Then when established an early refractive status epilepticus, that is 30 minutes to 48 hours, we go for IV metazolam. And then uh, late refractive status epilepticus, we go for other medications like uh, uh, PTB or other medications, or sometimes we have to use other uh, therapy like uh, surgery or vagus nerve stimulation. Yeah, now we'll go to another important topic, women with epilepsy. First is the catamenial epilepsy. Some women experience a marked increase in seizure frequency around the time of menses. Estrogen, estrogen is a pro-convulsant, whereas progesterone is an anti-convulsant. Again, a very important concept. Estrogen is a pro-convulsant, whereas progesterone is an anti-convulsant. So when a person is having, when a woman is having seizures during menstruation, the natural progestins, that is a progesterone, which is an anti-convulsant is used. So natural progestins or intramuscular medroxyl progesterone may be of benefit to a subset of women. Women with epilepsy, next subtopic is pregnancy. Seizure frequency during pregnancy will remain unchanged in 50% of women, increase in 30% and decrease in 20%. So overall, there's, much, there's no much change uh, between seizure frequency in uh, pregnancy and pre-pregnancy levels. The overall incidence of fetal abnormalities in children born to mother with epilepsy is 5 to 6 percent compared to 2 to 3 percent in healthy women. And therefore, when a woman is put on an anti-epileptic drug therapy, there's an increased chance of getting congenital anomalies of the fetus to an extent of Two to three percent extra because the normal frequency is two to three percent with anti-epileptic duct therapy it becomes five to six percent but then because the potential harm of uncontrolled convulsive seizures on the mother and fetus is considered greater than the teratogenic effects of anti-seizure drugs it is currently recommended that pregnant women be maintained on effective drug therapy so pregnant women with epilepsy have to be maintained on effective anti-seizure drugs. Valproic acid is strongly associated with an increased risk of adverse fetal outcomes, especially neural tube defects. 
anencephaly or spina bifida because of non closure of anterior pore or the posterior pore. Patients should take folate 1 to 4 milligrams per day because the anti folate effects of anti convulsants are thought to play a role in the development of neural tube defects. Leviteristam, lamotrigine, and oxcarbamazepine are considered safe anti epileptic drugs in pregnancy. Enzyme inducing drugs such as phenytoin, carbamazepine can cause a transient and reversible deficiency of vitamin K dependent clotting factors in 50% of newborn infants because they are hepatic enzyme inducing drugs, carbamazepine and phenytoin. Therefore, although neonatal hemorrhage is uncommon, the mother should be treated with oral vitamin K 20 milligrams per day in the last two weeks of pregnancy and the infant should receive intramuscular vitamin K 1 milligram at birth, the mother who is on enzyme inducing drugs like phenytoin and carbamazepine. Contraception. Drugs such as phenytoin, carbamazepine can significantly decrease the efficacy of oral contraceptives via enzyme induction. So patients should be advised to consider alternative forms of contraception or their oral contraceptive medication should be modified to offset the effects of anti-seizure medications. So phenytoin and carbamazepine are en hepatic enzyme inducing drugs. So they metabolize the oral contraceptive medications fast resulting in contraception failure. Breastfeeding. Given the overall benefits of breastfeeding and the lack of evidence for long-term harm to the infant by being exposed to anti-seizure drugs, mother will epilepsy can be encouraged to breastfeed. Breastfeeding should be encouraged to all, with, all women with epilepsy with caution, possibly only in those mothers using phenobarbital because phenobarbital can be found in significant levels in breast milk. So these are all the wonderful concepts of anti-epileptic therapy, the principles of anti-epileptic therapy, the other important concepts of neurology I have put in a question and answer format in the book Focused Neurology written by me, Dr. S. Srinivas. This book is available online from all leading booksellers, including Amazon. So if you're interested, you can buy this book online. So here within this one hour, I tried to give a gist of the anti-epileptic drugs. But if you want more details, you can go back to my YouTube channel, Dr. Srinivas Medical Concepts, Dr. Dr. Srinivas, S-R-E-E-N-I-V-A-S, Medical M-E-D-I-C-A-L, Concepts, C-O-N-C-E-P-T-S. You can like, share the link, and please subscribe my YouTube channel, Dr. Srinivas.